<laughs> Very far back from the microphone. It's fine. I've got a loud voice. Should be okay. Oh, bear with me. All right. Also, be careful. I've got a water bottle and lots of computer equipment as well. So be aware of that. Amen. Well, fantastic. Well, good morning, everyone. Hope you're all doing well. Um, this fine morning, I woke up this morning and the sun was shining outside my window. It was streaming in. It was a lovely, lovely day. And it is, and it's not unpleasant outside. It's fairly mild. When the sun comes out, it's actually quite, quite nice, quite warm. So, um, yes, today I'm going to be, have the privilege to preach um, the word this morning. Um, if you don't know, my name is up there. It's Jamie Akinlay. Um, that's how, that's how I say it. So my dad says it as well. I'm sure my grandma and the Nigerians in the room will tell me off for that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Not going to attempt it. Um, but, you know, so, so this morning we're going to continue our series in the book of Ephesians. And today we're going to be in Ephesians chapter five. And so if you can turn me to Ephesians chapter five, this is where we'll take our text this morning. The title of the sermon, I don't have it have slides, unfortunately. Um, but the title of the, of the sermon today is Children of Light. Um, I've got two points this morning. But before that, let, let's start. Let's read. Um, I'm going to split it up into two chunks. I'm going to read the first part of Ephesians um, 5 and then the second part a bit later on as well. So in Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 1, hopefully everyone can hear me on their computer screens. I think so. We'll see. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. It says, follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual morality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. I'm going to stop there for now. We'll, we'll hit we'll tackle the rest of it a bit later on. But it, it, it's very interesting. Whenever I read a passage, if I see a passage like this and it says, follow God's example, therefore, I'm always struck initially of why therefore? Therefore what? You know, what reason are you calling the people to follow God's example? Why is that? And when we look back previously in chapter four, Paul is teaching, he's talking to them, telling them to put off kind of Gentile living, to put off falsehood, to not live as the Gentiles around them do, or in a better wording, to not live as the nations do. You might be thinking like, how can he tell them not to live like the Gentiles when they are, gen it, it, it's another word for nations. Don't live like the people around them. Instead, you know, live in a godly way. And you know, to, and then, and then at the end, he ends off with to be kind and forgiving to everyone around you, just in the same way God has forgiven all of them. And so it is after these instructions that Paul then calls the people that he's writing to, to walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved, as Christ had, has done. Uh, and this is why the therefore, it's because of what I've said before, therefore now, Follow God's example. Therefore, now live and love as Christ loves. And he, and he paints it in this very interesting light. He calls it, you know, as, you know, love as Christ, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And this wording is really interesting because the term a fragrant offering was an offering that would have, okay, um, is, a, is an offering that would, of, of, or maybe I'm not in camera, <laughs> is, a, is an offering that would have deeply pleased God. It was an offering that would have been the, the kind of the highest offering that someone could give to God. If you look at, for example, Cain and Abel, and Abel, we know God looked on his offering with favor. It was a fragrant offering. And as, and as described here, Jesus was that fragrant offering as well. 
live an unblemished life and then dying um, to save to save people. But then again, what we see here in Ephesians 5 is Paul then reminds the people again on how to live and to not live in any way that goes against living like Christ. And so so this brings me to my first point, which is a little bit, it can't hurt, right? Just a little bit. And so we we pick up here in this text, we see in verse, from verse three down that Paul is here, he's instructing the people in the ways in which they're not to live. You know, the ways in which it is not proper for God's people to be living. You know, certainly not what a fragrant offering would look like. And he lays out this list of, of different ways of living, different sins that primarily focus on sins of pleasure, uh, sins of indulgence, and sins of vulgarity. And I think the, the all likelihood is, is because when we when we understand at this time in these cities, in these places, these were the things that were routinely happening. This was the life that people were living. These were the things that were most prolific in this culture at this time. And when we, when we look a bit deeper, I'll read, read through this, looking a bit deeper into it, and I'm trying to understand, okay, why, you know, what are what is the culture like in in the Greek and the Roman world at this period? And some of the things that, that came up is that a lot of their views towards things like sexual morality and impurity and obscenity were very skewed, very all over the place, very varied. Um, and they bled into areas of life, they bled into people calling them areas of tr- held beliefs of the Greek world was that the use of prostitutes was completely normal. It was fine as if as a way to control your urges. Oh, totally fine. If it's controlling your urges, that's completely fine to do that. As, as long as it didn't become an addiction. That was completely seen as normal in society. Um, the Romans made money from it and taxed it heavily. What's really interesting as well is that a minor, a minority of some of the, the non-Jewish believers who, who converted at this time, they also saw this practice as acceptable, as a way of controlling adultery. Oh, I'm, I, I, this stops me from committing other acts of sexual morality. It's my way of controlling it. And I think this is what Paul is hitting on them here, is this double standard of living. The way that they're saying it's fine to do this because it's helping something else. And instead, he calls them to this much higher standard that there shouldn't even be a hint of these things. Not even a little bit at all should be going on. He's saying that their use of prostitutes is immorality. It's not a controlling measure. It's immorality. He talks about not having any part in obscenity and coarse joking, saying that they are out of place. They don't belong in the family of believers. They don't belong there. They're not part of their society. And I think like them, like us today, it was a very common thing of society. Lewd joking. We see it now around us. You see it in the workplace, at school, whatever, whatever. But it was a very common thing back then as well. But I think it was even more so. Today, when you see it or if you hear it, it tends to be sometimes behind closed doors, you know, in, in groups of, of lads or ladies, maybe in small groups, but it's, kind of, it's not out on the street. It's not public. In many Greek and Roman towns, you would see explicit jokes just pasted along the walls of the cities, of the temples. You'd go into the public baths where you'd go to wash and there'd be explicit mosaics upon the wall. And people would point and laugh and joke, and it was just a normal part of society. But you go into the swimming pool and finding explicit mosaics on the wall. It was a normal occurrence. And, and of all of this, Paul is stating to them and letting them know very clearly that if any of them are immoral in this way, if any of them are impure in this way, if any of them are greedy or obscene, you know, if they're striving to, to live life in getting as much as they can then they're an idolater, that none of this should be in um, God's family believers. And, and idolatry seems a bit interesting to compare it to. Why are they an idolater? And I think that's primarily because, you know, they're worshipping something above God. 
that that is what their heart and their mind is set upon. That's where their focus is. It's on themselves. They're, work, they're not maybe on their knees worshiping these things, but that is where their heart and their minds goes to first. And Paul makes it very, very clear that such a person has no inheritance, no part in God's kingdom. People who live like this do not have a connection to the body of Christ. And this is God's standard. This is the high standard of God, that there is no part of this in anything. And, and it's, it's very clear, we see in verse 6, that God's wrath comes on those who are who do not follow God's teaching, who do not follow the commands. And what's, what's, what I find really interesting and really kind of a bit mind-boggling is that he's, he's talking here to the disciples, he's talking here to the Christians, and he's telling them that, you know, you can't have any part of this. There's nothing, you can't have any part. And you know, I don't, I think he's, he's, he's definitely talking to all of them, but he's definitely hitting more on those who are consistently giving into temptation, consistently sinning, consistently and repetitively living lives that are not godly. And we see in, in verse six, it says, let no one deceive you with empty words. And we see this empty wording because at the time there were many believers saying to each other, oh, it's fine for you to indulge in coarse joking. It's fine for you to indulge and be greedy because you're saved. You're a Christian. It's fine. Don't worry about it. But, but Paul, Paul is letting them know that that's not true at all. If you're disobedient, God's wrath is coming. You know, it's not just because you are saved. It's not a free license to live however you want, to do whatever you want, whenever you want to do it. And we see what I think is a very clear call to both the believers here and to others who are not yet believers, that living like this only leads to God's wrath. It is disobedient. And for the disciples, they can't live like this. Why? Because they are no longer darkness. As it says in verse 8, they are now children of light and they should live as such. And when I read this verse, when I look at this kind of text initially it brings me back um, many many years ago oh gosh I, I don't even want to think about the, the teens joke and tell me how old I am I'm 27 I don't think I'm old but the teens are like oh Jamie you're so old but <laughs> I'm dreading the day someone calls me uncle that, that's, that's gonna be the oh no but I remember being at one of my first teen camps and you know if you're not familiar with teen camps we kind of we, we go away to somewhere we go kind of like a farm area like stay in cabins we have a week-long um kind of games and lessons and kind of you know great times of prayer and worship of God together it was awesome but I remember it's probably my first one I was about 13 or 14 I can't remember but the, the camp was called Righteous Rebellion which I thought was amazing I've still got my t-shirt probably doesn't fit but I've still got it and I remember hating camp I didn't want to be there I called mum after two days was like take me home she was like stay and I was like all right I'll give it another day it was great I loved it but one of the lessons one of the lessons for the men talked about this passage and one of one of the one of the the, the brother leading the lesson Alex Hernandez he shared a really great example that helped me really visualize and put this principle into practice and his example was, and I love it, and I still use it today, is, I'm sure many of you might have heard this, is imagine that I gave you a plate of brownies or a, an amazing cake fresh out of the oven, decorated, covered in icing. At this point, I'll, I'll just say my girlfriend, Halamine, makes an amazing, like, biscuit, yogurt, chocolate, jam, something cake. Oh, my goodness. She made one. I ate the whole thing in, like, a day. Like, it's unbelievable. It's gone very red now, but there we are. <laughs> oh, there we are. A little bit of fun. But imagine I made this for you. Imagine you got given a cake like this, and you're about to dive into it. You can't wait to eat this, whatever it is. And then I say, oh, well, let me just go through the ingredients, make sure you're not allergic to anything. And as, you're, as I go through, the last ingredient I say is I put a teaspoon of dog poo in it. Oh. It just gives it a great texture. <laughs> How many of you would then proceed to eat 
that cake or brownie? No one? Not at all? No, no one at home maybe? No, I'm not seeing any hands. It's, it's only a little bit. It's like a teaspoon. Like in the grand scheme of things, it's not that much in the cake, really. No? No takers? I, I didn't think so. You know, even though it's just a hint, none of us would eat that. And this analogy really, really impacted me and still impacts me when I read this passage. And, and for yourself say, it's, it's how you look at sin and the ways that you live that do not please God. A hint is too much. Paul's message is a strong and clear message. It, it is a harsh message. It's a strong one. It's tough to handle. But it's very clear and very applicable today. Even though it's old and it's you know, over 2,000 years old, it still applies so readily and easily to everyone today. And it's a real rem- it should be a reminder to all of you, especially all of you who are here as, as disciples here in the room or those on, on, on at home, you know how to live. You know what pleases God. You should know what pleases God. You, you can't live like this. It's also clear instructions to anyone here who is not yet a disciple, who is figuring that out, who's trying to find out, okay, what are God's standards? This is the standard. It's not even a hint. You know, it's not a case of saying, I can do a little bit of something because it helps me avoid bigger sin. There's no scale with God. God sees all of the things we do against him as the same. In, in Romans chapter 3, you know, verse 23, let me just, I was going to paraphrase, let me just pull it up quickly. It's a joy of an iPad Bible. Um, but it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know, in God's eyes, sin is sin. It doesn't matter how little or how much, it's all the same. There is no scale. And so what is that hint for you? pornography is it a little bit of you know bad language in music is it maybe a few too many drinks out with your mates is it a little bit of coarse joking and office banter or banter with the lads as sometimes it's referred to I, i definitely find that one hard as well that that joking aspect i went to boarding school got a lot of boarding school mates you know even even mates at church but it's hard to get out of that pull of coarse joking the and, and it gets labeled as oh it's just banter it's fine it's not these are not in proper place for god's people you know what is it for you paul addressed all of these things because they were relevant to the people at the time they were their idols what is it going to be for you what do you justify as being all right to put before God? Is it TV? Is it gaming? Is it laziness? Is it your career? What is it you're putting first? And what I I find at the end is Paul then ended this very direct message that for you who are continuously and consistently committing the same sins again and again and again, with seemingly no sense of consequence, no sense of oh, it doesn't mean anything. I can keep doing this. I'm fine. No, (laughs) just because you're a Christian today does not give you any reason to continue to live like this. Romans 6 talks about, you know, you've died to sin. How can you live in it any longer? How can you live in it any longer? If you're not yet a Christian and, you know, know, maybe it's the first time you're hearing it, but this is the You know, in in the temptations of my life and the sins that have plagued me over the years, and I'm sometimes reluctant to be serious about dealing with these things. And I can try and justify, I'm sure we've all tried to justify living in certain ways. The reality is it's just simple disobedience to God. It's as simple as that. And as we see here, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Are you as disgusted with those hints of sins in your life as you would be 
if I gave you a dog poo brownie. But this isn't God's plan. This isn't God's wish. God wants us to be children of light. That's what we're going to talk about next. Hope you're still with me. Into the rest of it. As we see in verse 8, it says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what I mean, what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything is it, everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated. Dead and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine. To one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll stop there. It's interesting, what we see here in this section again is that, you know, Paul tells the people, he's told them how, you know, he shouldn't live. And he describes the life that they're called to actually be, the way they're meant to live. This, he uses wording of being a child of light. You know, and, and you know, he, he's detailing in this section what living in the light looks like, but also what living in the darkness looks like and how, you know, one is, you know, more than the other, how you need to be in the light. And, but I think what is interesting, he talks about it in a practical way, in a practical sense of living. It's not just purely intellectual instructions and theory, it's practical application, it's practical um, life. And so, you know, as we look at kind of looking at the first part from kind of verses eight to 14, it's primarily focusing on this light and dark back and forth, this go between between the two. And, he, you know, he reminds very clearly you were once darkness, as it said earlier on, that fragrant offering of Christ. That's what led people out of the darkness to become children of light. And so now as a child of light, produce goodness, righteousness, and truth. That is what light produces. That's what a child of light is going to be doing. He lays it very clearly to them that this is what it looks like. You know, it's not these fruitless deeds of darkness that he tells them to have nothing to do with. And it's a little bit of an odd phrasing, fruitless deeds of darkness, like deeds of darkness. Apparently when he's writing, he's referring to the behaviors of the people. There were kind of these cult practices and ritualistic practices that went on. And basically it was just, you know, people would get together at nighttime and they would drink to excess. They would take drugs. They would indulge in kind of sex parties. And this is these fruitless deeds of darkness. He's telling them to have no part of at all. Instead, it's, they're meant to expose them. As a child of light, he's telling them, you've got to expose these ways of living. I think this is done in two ways that, 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 that what we see here. The first is it's to talk to people, to tell them, you know, what are God's standards, what are God's instructions? That's kind of that exposing these deeds to people. You know, telling believers and non-believers what is wrong, what is not appropriate. Because another way to expose is to expose through living to expose by their life. You know, for them, he's telling them, if you live a life of God, you live as an example of what God is, of what Jesus is, you can expose people's actions, the way people are living. You know, we can see this in verse, you know, 13, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. You know, it's that if you're, if the disciples there are living in a godly way, people are going to look at that and be like, huh, yeah, that is actually a better way to live. That becomes very clear. Yeah, what I'm doing isn't actually helping me in any way. This is a better way to live. And 
by living as this example of the light, they can then push others around them to live in the light as well and to be lights as well. And when we look further down, we then see this very kind of practical push to live in a wise way, to have you know, godly wisdom. When Paul talks about wisdom, it's in a practical sense. As I said, it's something. It's hearing it and applying it. You know, to make the most of every single opportunity to live this holy practical life. You know, a real life of faith. Faith, you know, it, it has actions. It, it does lead you to do things. And you know, I think, you know, Paul, Paul, Paul goes on, he tells them to, he, he got, he's got this command about not getting drunk. People were drinking excessively, these rituals, to try and achieve a higher plane, to try and commune with the spirits. And instead, he says, be filled with the spirit. Maybe there's a little play on words there, you know, avoid spirit, you know, be with the spirit. Um, but he tells them this happens through hymns, psalms, songs, and praise, remembering God. And so being a child of light here in the room on, on camera, if you're a disciple today, remember you were once in the darkness. You're not anymore. You're in the light. You're a child of light. If you're not a disciple today, if you're studying the Bible, if you're not sure, if you're not sure where you stand, don't switch off. This is still for you. You can become a child of the light. And I think very simply, being a child of light is just is living a godly life. And I think it breaks down a number of ways. It's this practical pursuit of God and godly things. It's being an example to those around us with your life. It's being filled with the spirit and bringing light to people's lives. And living this godly life first starts with knowing how does God want you to live? What Look at verse 10. It says, find out what pleases the Lord. This is this clear instruction. Go and find out. What, is, what does God find pleasing? What does he find amazing? For, for you today, you've got a lot of resources to find out what is God, what pleases God. For the believers here, they just had the Old Testament. We've got the whole Bible. We've got the internet. We've got wise heads in the room you can ask questions to. Now, I said, I said this with the teens the other day. I said, ask, us, ask your teen leaders questions. Frustrate us with your difficult questions. Find out what's going to please God. And this is, this, is, this is, as I said, it's written to the believers. As the believers today, you've still got to find out what pleases God. You've still got to be asking those questions. You've not found out enough. You've still got to be finding that out. And so first, read the Bible. See what it says. But above that, it's then putting what you learn into practice. It's about doing what it says. Paul writes them to be careful how they live. You know, to live as wise people, not as those who are unwise. And for all of you today, it's about applying the wisdoms that you hear. Applying the things that you hear and you learn from other disciples, from the Bible, from you know, talks, whatever it is. It's applying that understanding and using it. Because that is what being wise is. It's hearing sound teaching and actually doing it. You would, you would, if you told someone, hey, don't play in the road because playing in the road is dangerous, someone who's wise would be like, okay, let me not do that. If you're playing in the road, you're clearly, you're like, ah, it's foolish. You would all agree. And so, you know, and this is what Paul's doing. He's letting them out some clear reminders of what living for God looks like. Living, being, living, you know, what living a wise life looks like. And, you know, as we've, as we've seen further back, an unwise life has dire consequences. It leads to God's wrath. And if you say, don't be foolish, you know, str truly strive to understand and in your understanding apply and live, you know, according to God's will. And maybe you're sitting here, you're thinking this is a bit restrictive. Why is this so harsh? Why is this so difficult? What, 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 what on earth? When we hear something, we're like not sure about it. But I think with, as we read this in John chapter 8, 
hold to my teaching, you're really my disciple, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. If you're not sure, if you're a bit like, oh, it seems a lot, a lot of things seem a lot in life, but you don't find out if it's good until you do it. Going to the gym is pretty brutal when you first start going, but you find it's actually beneficial. Going on a diet isn't fun when you first start doing it, but you find it's beneficial. It's the same with following God's commands. It might, it's, it, it will be tough, it will be hard, but you see the benefits in the long term. By living this way, by living a godly life, you can You know, the way you live directly impacts those around you. If you didn't, if you didn't know that, that's what happens. You know, if you look at children, children copy their parents. I remember being a kid and copying the way my dad would dress. You know, I had a green t-shirt, he had a green t-shirt, I'd wear black jeans, he'd wear black jeans. Like, I'd copy him, we'd wear the same clothes, watch the same shows. I'm a big Star Trek fan because of my dad. Um, you know, you have an impact on those around you and you can have a spiritual impact on those around you as well you know being a true child of the light means shining that light into the lives of those around you your friends your family your colleagues you know the people you meet out on the street you can shine that light you can be an example to them and by doing so it gives them a real idea of what a good life looks like you know a life free from anxiety, a life free from stress and worry and pain and hurt. You know, I think about when I did my exams at university, I'm sure I've shared this before, but I would go to exams and the night before I would just pray. The morning of I'd pray, I read my Bible and I show up to my exam. Everyone's furiously like cramming and I'm just there, just chill. And they're like, Jamie, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, prayed about it this morning. I'm good now. And they're like, why, why are you not stressed with me? I'm like, don't need to be. You know, that's what we can give to other people. People can look at that and be like, I want that. You know, I think finally, being filled with the Spirit. I think this is a really interesting thing. It's that, you know, when we read what Paul says about, okay, how do you be filled with the Spirit? It says in verse 19, by speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, song, and songs from the Spirit, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you do, he's saying that you, you do this by speaking to other with psalms, through songs and hymns, by praising and giving thanks to God. Sounds a lot like church. <laughs> It is. You come together. You know, you, you speak to each other. You sing together. You praise God together. You're worshipping him. You know, it's awesome to see so many people here today. See so many people in the room. You know, it's great seeing kind of the numbers go up on the registration. And I know many of us, are many people are still at home. It's great to see faces on the camera at home as well. And I think, but I think, you know, there are lots of us still at home. That's not a judgment. I know things are difficult. I know there are tough situations. People have to shield, have to be careful. But I think as restrictions lift, as vaccines roll out, as the country moves forward, I think we all need to start taking bigger steps of faith and start coming back to church again. Because I know there are some difficult circumstances out there, but I also know there are some people who could come back to church and maybe aren't. You know, have you become comfortable with not having to get up early, shower, put on some decent clothes and come out to church, like make time to travel? Is the roll out of bed at 10.55? Come on. You know, this is, in order to be filled with the Spirit, it requires, you know, for you to be filled with the Spirit, it means being surrounded by other people who will fill you as well as God, but it comes from other people, you know, other people sharing, Hey, I, I read this today. Oh, awesome. Let's sing together. Let's worship God together. But then, so you've got a part to play because you come and you fill other people. It's not just, you know, it's not a one way thing. It's a two way street. 
this family of God is so important and it's so crucial for a life that is in the light. You know, as, 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 we, as we wrap up here today, you know, if you are a Christian today, remember that you were once in the darkness. You were once separated. But now you are a child of light. If you're not a Christian today, you can become a child of light. You can get to this point. You can be part of this family. But either way, no matter where, what camp you stand in, God's standard does not change. The way he calls you to live does not change. There cannot be a hint of these sins in your life. There cannot be repetitive and consistent you know, sin and living you know, ungodly ways. You know, putting and justifying the way you live above what God commands. You need to be as disgusted as that dog poo brownie. Being a child of light is about living a life for God. It's about finding out what his commands are. It's about looking for that, trying to seek that every single day. But it doesn't stop there. It means apply it. Live it. Let it become you. You know, let that be your identity and then spread that light to other people. God's plan, God's wish. To be something that pleases him so deeply. To become children of light. Thank you. Amen.